All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Brand new interviews here every Friday morning on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Go down to the Patreon link and you can ask questions of the guests, like our guest today uh, from the multi platinum band Striper. Can you believe it's been 40 years of Striper? Coming up next year, we'll be celebrating 40 years. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit about Rock's regime because I think a lot of people don't realize that Striper started out in the same clubs as Motley Crue and Rat and Wasp. And with their message, maybe it was a little tough at times. So I want to get into a little bit of that. But really, the main thing, Michael, we're here to talk about is the final battle. Striper's The Final Battle is available everywhere right now. Is this actually the final battle? Stick around. Just All right, I've been waiting a long time to have him here. Michael Sweet. Hey, brother. Uh, I'm, I apologize for not being in some plush studio somewhere, you know? That's right. You're, you're in the process of moving, which is one of the worst processes in the world. Well, yeah, we moved. We sold our house back in September of last year. We bought an RV. We were basically traveling in the RV for a while and going from place to place, you know, living with my daughter and uh, being homeless and staying in campgrounds in the RV. And we're finally in our new house, but we're in it, but we're not settled. We've got a lot of work to do. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where we, he rushed us to get us in the house. And because of that, there's all sorts of things that we're having to deal with. Like right now, the guys are here hooking up our washer and dryer. We've been going to a laundromat uh, for the past few months. And that's, that's not fun, but here we are. Where do you make home now, Michael? Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, Crazy, that's huh? Yeah, that's your place. That's the uh, it's the opposite of uh, of Hollywood, right? <laughs> it is the opposite of Hollywood. Uh, I, I grew up in Hollywood. I was born and raised, and although I have very fond memories of of L.A. and California, there's no looking back for me. I would never. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to California. I think a lot of people would say that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, those early days. But I want to mention right now the final battle, which is available everywhere. And you can go to striper.com. Uh, Michael, I got to tell you, you guys crank out quality records. It's, uh, it's a very odd thing that you can, every record, if you're a fan of Striper, I don't think you will be disappointed in the music they make. And if you're a new fan, there's people, young people discovering you all the time. I think you'll love these records. They're hard, uh, hard rock music and uh, great songs, great guitar, everything you could want. And uh, I said to Oz, I go, how do you guys keep putting these records out? And he said, Michael Sweet knows how to write a Striper song and he can crank them out. Uh, you just have this supply. H how do you do it, Michael? You know, man, I, it's really interesting. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't have a... a you know, format or a plan in place. I, I typically, with every album the past 10 years at least, uh, they were all written just a few weeks before we entered the studio. And uh, it was a song a day, and then we were in the studio after the last song was written. And, I, and I, that's just the way it was. And it's interesting because I think I uh, somehow subconsciously thrive on uh, being under pressure. I think it, it helps me with my process as an artist to work better and uh, to achieve what I need to achieve. Uh, I think if, if you gave me six months to write an album, I, I, I probably wouldn't be able to get it done because I would be unfocused. And I think the pressure helps me to focus, you know, to hyper focus. Yeah, uh, I get that. Um, you know, just having conversations with you, traveling and seeing you, you know, I'm tour managing Stephen Pierce, who played a lot of shows with Striper. Uh, I know that you are very, uh, you're very OCD about things. You have a way you want things done. You were telling me that even as far as the, how far the amps are from the drum riser, you're aware of these things. I really am, man. I drive up my crew crazy, our crew crazy. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's one of those things. I, I am OCD and ADHD and I talk, I've been talking about that for years, but you know, it's a, it's a hindrance, but I think it's also, it's a burden to a degree, but it's also a blessing. Um, you know, I do go out on stage as the guys are setting up and I want to make sure everything's lined up properly and 
the the logo isn't off by an inch and all that stuff. And it, again, it can make some people pull their hair out. But I think that's it's part of what makes us who we are. And, you know, we all have our own gifts. And that that's one of my, uh, you know, one of my issues is Robert has his stuff, his quirks with his kit and being the visual timekeeper. And Oz has his quirks. We all have our own little quirks. But, yeah, I am OCD, man. I'm going to I'm going to own that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably better to to admit it and, and to be aware of it. Um, it's what it is, bro. I, I mean, my dad had OCD too. I think I got it from him, but he used to go around and straighten all the magazines on the tables and, mm -hmm. and all the pictures. And as a bratty kid, I would go back after he would straighten them and I'd make them all crooked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it would drive him crazy and he didn't know who did it. But yeah, now I'm getting payback because I have the same OCD issue. Yeah, it's, it's full circle. Uh, I got to tell you, the thing I love about these Striper records is they don't sound like, you know, in an age where people can phone in their parts and you can make a record with everybody in different parts of the world, uh, you guys don't do that. And these records sound great. It, it, it's really, it doesn't sound like dialed in. Nothing seems like, a, here's another Striper record. We're just going to keep cranking them out. Each one is, seems better than the last. Well, man, thank you. Gosh, that's great to hear you say that. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you, there is a reason for that. We don't, we don't phone anything in. I mean... You know, when I work on some of these other side projects, I don't want to say we phone stuff in, but we are working in different locations. When I do a Sweet, Sweet Lynch album, for example, I get the music, then I go on my studio and I sing, then I send it back to them. We're not all in the same studio. But with Striper, we're all in the same studio, literally breaking bread together. We, we sleep, eat, and record in one location. And I think that really uh, translates over and into the music and the, the record itself. Yeah, I think so, too. And I, I think um, you, you build a character and personality together, and that applies to the, to the record because you're there. And it's obviously worked. Uh, I remember uh, No More Hell to Pay. It was when I started seeing the, 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 the rebirth of Striper, if you will, uh, of these albums. And then every time you guys... You know, there's going to be music videos. You know, I always say that Striper was really ahead of the game in a lot of ways. And your wife is a big part of that, Lisa, as well. Um, keeping that, you know, the merchandising and the branding and uh, and you guys, you know, ahead of the meet and greets, you always were fair with your prizes, not prices, not gouging people. And uh, really putting out collectibles and things that fans wanted, as well as great music. Yeah, man, I, I tell you, you, got, you said so much there to touch on, and, and uh, all of it's so true. I mean, we really try. We go out of our way to offer uh, the best music and, and merchandise that we can, but keep things really fair for the, for the fans. You know, you go to some of these shows and you see uh, T-shirts going for 65 bucks and 75 bucks, and I'm just thinking to myself, are you kidding me? And you go to the Striper booth and ours are 35 you know, and, and, you know, some people think maybe we're undercutting ourselves. I don't know, but we want to keep it fair. And we've always been about that. But we're also accused sometimes being a Christian, quote unquote, Christian band of fleecing the flock. You know, some people we hear we read comments daily from Striper fans, certain fans saying you guys are ripping people off. You should be, uh, you know, giving stuff away for free because you're Christians, you know, we get that all the time. But, and, and then to touch on my wife, uh, our uh, manager, co-manager, Dave Rose and my wife, Lisa, I mean, we couldn't do it without them. You know, Lisa is that uh, fifth member of the band and, and, you know, people don't know, know her face or know the name or think about Lisa, but man, I, we couldn't operate without her or without Dave. So yeah, it's important. And you, you, you as well. I mean, the bands that you represent, they couldn't function without you, man. And uh, it's it's so important. Management is such an integral part of the machine. Dana Strom told me, being in management, tour management, it's a thankless job because if everything goes well, it was 100% the band. But if it goes <laughs> bad, it's 100% your fault. And uh, so it's a thankless <laughs> job sometimes. But I try to be fair, man. I'm always fair. If something goes wrong, I don't instantly blame management. But, you know, I do get on the phone with management just try to get to the bottom of it. But yeah, that that's crazy, man. Management uh, it certainly gets the short end of the stick sometimes, for sure. Yeah. 
And you like you 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 are a hands-on guy with your business. You're not sitting back and letting someone do it. You 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 control that striper brand and make sure that it's what uh, what you began and what you uh, intended. And and that brings us to talking about Rock's regime just a little bit. You know, Stephen tells me the stories of the of the beginnings of what would become striper. Here's you and your brother. Uh, oh man, yeah. That's way, that's pre-Rock's regime. That's way back. I think I was probably right there in that picture, maybe 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, and your brother's a little, Robert's a little older than you. Yeah, I might have even been 12, 12 or 13 there. Yeah, Robert's three years, a little over three years older than me. So he would have been, you know, uh, 15, 16 in that photo. Did he, did he play music first? No, we both played music at the same time. We started when he started uh, becoming interested in drumming. I became interested in guitar, and my grandparents bought him his first drum set and bought me my first guitar, and uh, we started playing roughly at the same time. I was five; he was eight. Uh, but he got more serious about it sooner, and started a real band. You know, when he was, I, I want to say maybe fifteen. Uh, years old and I was 12 I was still a little young but I was becoming more interested in it and my dad kind of twisted his arm into auditioning me and eventually he did and I became the singer of his band I was almost 13 so literally in that fo that photo we were in a band together and I think the band was Aftermath right. uh, and, and and that's where it all began man it's so crazy I've heard a story, you never know if these are true or not, but that Robert was watching TV probably a Sunday morning and he saw Jimmy Swagger and that sort of motivated him to uh, to follow Christianity. Uh, 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 is that not the case? True story. Uh, he started watching Jimmy Swagger on TV and then the whole family started watching Jimmy Swagger. And once we all started watching together, we all accepted Christ right there in front of the television and, and got involved in a church. And it was just interesting how that played out. And the reason why my dad especially was interested in Jimmy Swagger is because when he sang, he sounded like Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. And my, my dad loved Elvis and we grew up on Elvis. So and Jimmy is the cousin of Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, Mickey Gilly. And they all kind of sing and play similar. And uh, we were we took interest in that because we're a very musical family. And obviously, later on in life, everybody knows the story, I believe, about how Jimmy started speaking out against Striper when Striper Cast, started. Casting yeah. pearls before swine is what he said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Holding our albums up. And it really hurt because we he was such an inspiration to us spiritually. Uh, and then to hear him say that about us, it really hurt. But as life uh, moved on and progressed, I realized like we're all human. We all make mistakes. Uh, nobody's perfect. And as we all know, Jimmy dealt with his own demons as well and, and uh, was kind of called out. And you got to be real careful when you judge other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's strange how these things uh, um, happen, especially at that time you know you 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 find somebody and then they don't uh necessarily prove if if you were wasp and jimmy swagger condemned you you would you'd have a platinum album but in the case <laughs> of, in the case of striper that that's going against your your base and obviously um would hurt so i'm fascinated by these early days i always hear the stories about you guys and these uh rehearsals in the warehouse and uh, and you know Tiffany, the pop singer, she was on the show, and she would tell me how she grew up, really even like Norwalk, and she would tell me, oh, you would go and see Striper, you know, rehearsing in the in the garage. The, and it's it's crazy to hear those those early days. It really is. It it is, and you know you can't you move on, you get older, and you almost to a certain degree forget about those early days, which were the most important days. That's the foundation, uh, and what. It, it shaped us into who we are and what we are today. Uh, yeah, the early days were humble. The early days, and not that they're not now, and not that we're not now, but back then, you know, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any money. Like, see that picture right there? All, all those clothes, all the stripes on the guitars, that's all handmade. That's all tape and varnish. We couldn't afford to get our instruments painted. We couldn't afford to buy custom-made clothes. So we bought carpet painted it, cut it, and wrapped it around our legs. 
Uh, and that's that those are the humble beginnings of this band. And, I, you know, that's the story with any band. Of course, I get it. But I just feel like Striper really went the extra mile back in the day. And I think that was due in part to our work ethic. We have a, our parents instilled within us a very uh, incredible work ethic to go out and work our butts off. Uh, even when you have nothing, you can still do the impossible. Even if you have no money and nothing at all, you can still achieve anything you want to achieve. Yeah, and, uh, and this shows it because, as you said, humble beginnings. But you can see the beginning of what would become Striper. At this point, it's a three-piece. You sing and play lead guitar. Now, yep. over the years, the story is that Doug Aldridge uh, was almost in the band. Is that true? That is true. And real quick, I, I'm going to touch on that. But that guitar and that photo, that's Stephen Piercy's old guitar. How funny. I bought that from Stephen. It's a white Gibson V. Do you still have it? I don't. I wish I did. Gosh, and I bet he wishes he did too. <laughs> he loves but, those uh, guitars. Yeah. It, Doug Aldridge. Yeah. Basically, what happened was Doug came out uh, from Philly, and uh, I met him in Hollywood. We hit it off. We became best of friends. We. we I don't know if Doug remembers this or not. Uh, I would like to think that he does. But we hung out and did everything together, uh, going to clubs. Uh, you name it, do, doing the whole the whole spiel. And we were best of buddies. And he came down. We were talking about forming uh, him joining uh, the band at the time, Rock's Regime. He wanted to uh, reform Lion, get the guys out in L.A. from Lion and, and do that. And we understood that. It didn't work out. Doug's one of my favorite players and, and an incredible person. And then C.C. DeVille as well. Right. met him on the streets of L.A. He came out from New York and same thing. Uh, he didn't like the yellow and black. He wanted to do the pink and purple, and he told us that. He's more. He said, "I'm more of the glam guy," you know, and and that was it. And uh, we we didn't we didn't play together. But man, we wish those guys nothing but the best, and they're they're wonderful people. It's funny how these things happen in history. You wonder, you know, what would have been? What probably would have been a very different uh, a band. You you talk a little bit about the yellow and black, and obviously what would become. Striper, but there were there were people who didn't get it. I had Vicki Hamilton on the show, who you know managed Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue uh, and, and these type of bands at times, right. and didn't really understand Striper. And I think a lot of people might have not understood, um, you know, the Christian message. You guys were so ahead of your time. And one of the things I don't think people realize is that, like I said in the intro, you guys are playing the same venues as Wasp. Wasp, Wasp might be throwing meat, and you guys might be throwing Bibles, but you have to go out. And you probably have to work a little extra hard. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, the thing is with Striper, if you if anyone could walk in our shoes and experience the uh, the, the, the level of nervousness at times and the stress, anxiety, uh, you know, for example, we went and performed in Europe back in the 80s. And when we got there. Everyone's, I think, heard this story, but I'll just repeat it briefly. We got there and we got out of the van and we went backstage and we heard the whole crowd chanting something in unison, like loud, loudly, like, ah, nah, nah, nah. we're like, what is going on? Went out to the side of the stage and they were chanting F Striper, F Striper, F Striper, the whole crowd, you know, 8,000 people in unison, mostly guys with leather jackets and spikes. And we had to go out and perform to that crowd a crowd that hated us. Uh, and we were playing with all these other death metal bands. They were throwing stuff at us and, uh, you know, burning uh, upside down crosses with Robert's picture on them. Uh, and we're out there performing thinking, what are we doing? Are we crazy? And we cut all the ballads out of the set and just gave them all the heavy tunes. And after three songs, we won them over. And after the show, they came, guys were coming up to us saying, we thought you guys were pussies. We had no idea. Uh, but you guys kicked our butts. We love you, and we're fans now. We won the crowd over. So that's been a lifetime of events like that, a lifetime. We just played with Merciful Fate and Behemoth that's right. that's in, a big... in Mexico. Uh, and we go out, you know, we start, as before we go out and perform, we're thinking, what's going to happen? Are we going to get booed off the stage? Are are they gonna like us? What we th this is this is a daily event in the life of Striper. 
having to win over the crowd. While you have a loyal Christian base, it wasn't always that way. And you have to try to, like you said, win over these other audiences. Uh, when I was growing up, there was plenty of my friends who weren't Christian, but loved Striper. And when you guys were playing on Dial MTV against Poison and Guns N' Roses and these other bands, you were one of the bands. Um, the Christian message was there if people wanted it, uh, but you proved by being successful in Japan, somewhere where Christianity is not the, the, a major factor. You've showed that people love the music. For sure. And there's no question about it. And I mean, we only know that based on our experience and in, in all the situations we've been involved with. I mean, we'll go to Europe and, you know, we got a, a major interview and the guy comes in and he's the head of the satanic church, you know, in, uh, in Poland or in what have you. And he comes in and he sits down and interviews us and he says, you know, I, I'm a satanist. I don't believe what you believe, but I'm, you're my favorite band. And, and I just sit there in shock thinking, how is this possible? You know, we're his favorite band. He's listening to words about Jesus over and over again, but he's a Satanist. And it just kind of blows my mind. And that's the power of music. And it shows you that if someone doesn't like the lyric or agree with the lyric, they love the song or vice versa. So it's interesting to me. We have a lot of fans that are Satanist and atheist, yet we're, we're a band comprised of Christians. It's very interesting. Yeah, and maybe that's, uh, that works towards your message. And I think that, you know, as Christians, you were out there to, to spread the word. That's part of what uh, you do. And so I, I'm curious. I have my Striper Bible right here. When I was a, when I was a kid, we were at uh, Disneyland, me and my mother, and uh, Striper was playing. And I saw all these rockers and metal heads, and I thought, well, they look kind of like me, but I didn't know Striper yet. And somebody told me, oh, they're great, but they, they throw these Bibles. And in my mind, I thought, they must have these hardcover King James Bibles. It was, <laughs> someone's going to poke, poke an eye out. When did you guys start that idea? Oh, man, it, from the very beginning. Before we were Striper, we were Rock's Regime. And, you know, this is when we were Rock's Regime, Tim joined the band and we all decided to devote the band to God and to commit our lives and music to God. Once we did that, I forget who suggested Bibles, throwing Bibles out. I think it might have been Michael Guido, who has been a pastor to us and a dear friend. And again, the fifth member of Striper. Uh, he suggested Bibles and we thought, wow, what a great idea. We started throwing these little pocket sized New Testaments like the one you just held up, but without Striper logo or stickers on them. And they were left all over the venues. <laughs> and we thought, oh, this is not good. This isn't working. We got to figure out a way to make these people take these Bibles. So we started putting the Striper sticker on. And ever since we did that, we've never seen one Bible left. And they're in high demand. I mean, it's it's our probably most requested piece of, if you will, merchandise, but we don't sell them. We never sell Bibles. Uh, we give them away, always have from the very beginning. And we I can't even tell you how many we've given away from the very beginning, but I would say hundreds of thousands probably. It has to be. And yes, it's hard to get. I've been to a lot of Striper concerts and uh, it's hard to get that Bible. It took me a lot of work. So uh, and people want it. It's a, it's a cool collectible. And maybe someone takes it home and reads it as well. Uh, you, you know, know message that would be, that's always our wish and our hope. And that would be phenomenal. In the day, we used to throw out 200 Bibles per show, you know, back when we could afford to to buy that many. Now we're down to 20. You know, Bibles are, are costly. They're expensive and they're heavy. When we travel with them, we got to take the weight into account and everything. So but yeah, we'll never stop throwing out Bibles. That's part of who we are and what we are and a very integral, important part of what we do. Michael, do you have to carry insurance to throw out the Bibles? Is that true? Is it in the contracts? No. Okay. The insurance isn't, well, you know what? That's not entirely, I'm not being 100% accurate. We, we have insurance. We have to uh, travel and pay for insurance. We try to do that in a smart way so we're all covered. And I would assume that that might be covered to a degree in there if someone were hurt by a Bible. But these days, we toss them out. We don't throw them out. Robert used to tape them and throw them. And he literally made people bleed back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. 
Uh, but that's, you know, listen, again, you're playing with Wasp and Motley Crue. Maybe, that's, maybe that helps fit in. So when you're playing with all these bands, bands like Rat, you know, Stephen really liked Rock's regime and what became Striper and you, know, you guys were peers. But some of the bands, you must have felt like this, this is just couldn't be more opposite. So, so what was it like playing those venues with the other bands? Oh, man. Well, it was always, like I said, that feeling of nervousness, not understanding the moment, knowing what was going to happen or about to happen. But then once we perform, we realize after the performance, we're all human beings. We're all basically the same. You know, in, in other words, like I just met uh, Kim, uh, King Diamond, Merciful Fate. And all these years, I've, I've had this perception of Kim. And then I met Kim and he was like so polite. One of the nicest guys I've ever met. And uh, very cordial and friendly and took a picture and shook my hand and looked into my eyes and uh, engaged in conversation. And you could tell he was interested in talking. And I just was blown away. And all those perceptions were uh, annihilated because I felt like, okay, here's this guy that probably won't like us or like me. And we had a great conversation. And, you know, if we went to dinner and, and, and had a, a dinner, we'd probably have a great dinner. But we're polar opposites. Uh, so I find that very interesting. And and at the end of the day, it, it, it makes me realize that we're all the same. We're all flesh and blood. We all have feelings. We all have emotions. And most of those are the same. Yeah. And uh, I think it's great that you, you show that. You know, I, recently you were talking about how divided the world is right now. Our, our country in particular, even, uh, uh, you know, people have decided through politics and through religion or whatever it may be that they have to, you have to have an enemy. It's you're on this side or that side and that's it. And it's a terrible way to be. And you prove that people of all different faith and uh, beliefs can get along. You know, your project with George Lynch, you guys couldn't be more opposite in, in certain ways, but your love for music and guitar uh, is, is a bond, obviously. 100%. Right on the nail on the head, man. Uh, yeah, it, it's even I'll be honest, even I back before I started working with George and doing these kinds of projects used to think like, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'd be compromising. I'd be compromising. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, no, actually, it's the opposite. I'm compromising by not doing it. And the reason why I say that is because by working with George, we're proving to the world that you can work together, even if you have different views. And that's the sad part about our world, especially politics. There's red and blue. You're either this side or that side. There's no middle ground. And it's like, that's just BS. That's a lie, unfortunately, that's been put in our heads and in our hearts that we've all believed and bought. And it's so far from the truth. Why can't we sit down and talk about politics over dinner and not fight about it? You know, it's this really weird state that we're in and it's gotten worse, I think. And I think the Internet has fed, fueled the fire. Uh, but George and I are proving that you can work together, even if you have different views. Yeah. Uh, when George was on my show, I, it's one of the most controversial. I didn't think it was. At one point, he mentions that he may be atheist. Boy, the anger and the messages that I get over that interview. And I try to make the point that if Michael Sweet works with him and makes records, I think you're misplacing um, your anger. And uh, like we said, we're all, we're all human at the end of the day and, uh, and everyone has their own uh, values. No doubt. And, you know, I think the thing with George and people like George, you know, George, George was a Christian before. This is what he told me. And he went to church. But he was burnt by the church. And he's an atheist now, or as he puts it, a free thinker. And I think that's the problem. I think a lot of times we're burnt by the church and we're burnt by Christians. So we want to run as far away from that as possible. But at the end of the day, we don't realize and we forget that people are people. They're going to blow it. They're going to make mistakes. Don't put your faith in people. Put your faith in God. God never blows it. And, you know, uh, I think that's important for us to realize uh, God doesn't make mistakes and he's never going to betray you or leave you. People will, though. Yeah. And you hear that a lot. People had bad experiences. Uh, just because you had a bad experience with a person or a place doesn't mean that all the experiences uh, would be that way. So, exactly. 
Dialing back a little bit, um, so you guys record the demo that would become the first Striper record, and the demo really is the record for the most part, right? The demo is the record. I do not like demos. I used to have to do demos back in the day. The label would request demos, and of course, we were pawns to a degree. We'd, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll go on and do demos. These days, I, I don't do demos. If, if I talk to a label and they say, we want demos, I say, see you later. Hey, I'm not I'm not even having this conversation because I feel like demos are a waste of time and energy because what happens, at least for me, from my experience, is a lot of times we'll go do demos and then we can't recapture that energy or whatever it was that went into that demo on the real album. So I want to save all that for the real deal. And if people don't know that we can uh, do what we do and and turn in a good album by now, then they never will. You know, we've been doing this for 40 years, so it, it, trust us or don't, you know. <laughs> do you record a lot of extra tracks or do you go in and say, I'm putting my work into this, it's making the record? Yeah, I'd never record extra tracks either. We used to in the old days on occasion. One of those tracks was a song on the last album called uh, uh, Invitation Only. We recorded that for Against the Law that never got finished, but typically we don't go in. I'm not one of those guys that some of these bands you hear about is some of the bands talking in interviews like, oh, yeah, you know, we've got 29 songs for our next album. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, that's crazy. I mean, why not just come up with 11 good songs that you know are good? And why do you have to have 29 songs and then pick 11 out of the 29? It, it just boggles my mind. I just feel like that's such a waste of energy. Yeah, I, I, I like to hear you say that because I've always thought that, too. Put your effort into the songs you have. Make those good songs. You don't need to whittle yeah. away. I mean, you know, you know they're good or you know they're bad. If they're bad, dump them, get rid of them, and, and write a good song. I, I I don't know. I just that that mentality to me is is pointless. But again, it's just an opinion. You know, everyone has their different views on the matter. The way I write songs, I, I go in right before the recording. It's a song a day until there's eleven songs or twelve songs, and that's it. And we go in and record them. And we try to make the uh, performances as great as, as possible and, uh, and turn in a really good album. And so far, we've been blessed to be able to do that with each album. And, and the label seems happy, the fans seem happy, and we're happy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're talking about what, you know, you're always up against something. Enigma signs you guys. They have Motley Crue as well. In those early days, I'm not sure they completely got the Christian message either. No, they didn't. As a matter of fact, they came out, we showcased for them. And apparently, I find this very odd, they couldn't hear one lyric. Uh, I, I, I have no explanation for it, but they couldn't hear one lyric because we, they loved us, they heard the music, they signed us, then we turned in the lyrics, and then they had a problem. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, these lyrics are Christian? And we're like, you didn't. We just showcased for you. You didn't hear us singing it during a break. Da, da, Jesus is the way, <laughs> you know. They missed that part. It, I mean, it, it blew my mind, but they almost uh, considered dropping us uh, because of the lyrics. Yeah, it's, uh, although I will say later on, people who are watching your songs, like honestly, on, uh, on MTV, I think that people thought these were love songs. Some people, maybe if you weren't a, a, a Christian, you thought, you know, uh, and it is a love song, but it's a different, it's not a, a, a high school at the drive-in at the beach guy and girl love song. It's a, it's a different thing. Exactly. And, they, and I, I always tried and try to write songs that can be relatable from both sides of the fence. So I don't want to compromise who I am or compromise the lyric, but I try to write songs that if someone that is an atheist listening or uh, someone that doesn't believe in God, uh, it, you know, that they might be able to relate to it and take it in a different way, maybe about their wife or their girlfriend or their a loved one or what have you. So uh, in songs like Honestly and Calling on You and, and all these kinds of things, I really try to think about that as I'm writing the lyric. Yeah, and uh, and shows I don't want to keep you all day. I know you've got things going on. A couple of questions. One I've always sort of wondered, and I'm sure you've explained it, but maybe my audience hasn't heard it. Uh, Brad Cobb played bass on two of the, you know, at the time, the biggest striper albums. How did, how did that happen that Tim Gaines didn't end up playing on those records? 
Well, here's the thing, man. Look, Tim is a brilliant bass player. Let's not take anything away from, from him as a musician. He's phenomenal. And uh, there's a reason why we asked him to join our band and really wanted him in our band, because he's great. Great player, great uh, great singer, great musician. But once we got to the To Hell With The Devil uh, sessions, there was a little different sound trying to be achieved. More of a, a really solid in the pocket. Tim's a little bit more from a jazz background, and I think he'd be the first to admit that. Uh, and we were going for more of a really solid, not that he can't do that, but more of a really solid eighth note, don't, 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 you know, in the pocket kind of thing to a click. That was the first album we tracked to a click, Robert as well. So because of that, we had these drums and, and guitars really solid to click. We were trying to achieve something different. Uh, so we wound up bringing in Brad Cobb. We auditioned numerous bass players, actually. Ricky Phillips was one of them, plays for Sticks. Uh, and we wound up going with Brad Cobb because he really delivered what exactly what we were looking for in that department. So there you have it. Did Tim leave the band at some point during that? Well, there's always a debate whether, and it doesn't really matter whether Tim left or whether we, we, uh, you know, we let him go. It, it, there's always that debate. And again, it who cares but we parted ways at that point and over the years numerous times i think it was a total of maybe four times this last one being the fourth i could be wrong at least three maybe four uh but you know what it, the thing is you know tim's part of the history an original member uh obviously you gotta pay respect to that and, uh, you know, we, we take nothing away from that or from him at all. Uh, it, he was a very important part of the band in the beginning of the band. There's no question about it. You value that. You value the history of the band and your original members. You did your best to keep that lineup together so many times. You went out and you did the 30th anniversary of To Hell with the Devil. You guys put on the cuts. You, you, you embraced it as much as you could. I think at times maybe uh, for the fans even that you put out. The, the There's no question. I mean, the thing is being in a band, it's really hard because you're dealing with different personalities and most of the time, really strong personalities. Everyone in this band has a very strong personality. You know, I do, Oz does, Robert does. We're all different, but very strong personalities. And we all kind of want things a certain way and expect that and we're all stubborn to a degree. Uh, so it makes it difficult to iron out the wrinkles uh, sometimes. But, you know, Striper has been able to do that, uh, especially with the three of us and, and continue on. And it's 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 hard, like bands like Kiss and some of these other bands, you hear these stories uh, and, you know, personality conflicts and differences. And it makes it impossible, sadly, for the original lineup to continue on. The fans want that but it's just not possible sometimes right. because it, like a marriage, it just goes sour and you have to part and go your separate ways uh, in order to be happy in life and to thrive in life. So I get it. I really do. Yeah. Sometimes what's best for the fan isn't always best for the band. Uh Oh, we lost Michael for a second. I'm sorry. Oh, Say that last part again. I was saying sometimes what's best for the fan or what they think isn't always what's best for the band. And you, you, Sometimes the sacrifice is not uh, not worth it. It's it's a hard thing to be together as a band, as a unit, as a family for that many years. Uh, speaking of family, I, I, I got to make sure I mentioned, I was talking to your brother, Robert, and he told me that right before Striper signed your record deal, he was uh, offered the job in Rat and that he was considering jumping ship and going and playing in Rat. And we both joked that there would have been a nicer uh, Bobby playing drums uh, for that band. But uh, it's it's funny how things work out, you, you know. It's he 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 you know he believed in Striper, and you got that record deal, and you're going to go that direction. But it, it's another one of those examples of how different things could have been. Absolutely, and they could have been very different. And I think we've all thought that at times. I mean, you know, I've it, early on, I I look back and offers and, and things that I people that approached me early on to to join their band. I, you know, I. I could have done that. 
and, and you know, with Boston, I could have stayed in Boston. And, and, and I, mean, I look back on that and I think, well, I'm glad I didn't. Because the thing is with all those bands, you know, as great as the music is and, and, and all the, the cool factor, there's a real purpose, not that there isn't with them, but there's a real purpose, a higher calling with Striper uh, at the end of the day. It's not just about cranking the amps and going out and putting on a show and all the glitz and glam. It's about a message and, and, and a faith and, and trying to inspire and change people's lives and people's hearts and help them through tough situations. It, it's just a different thing. So it's worth every penny. Has it been tough? Absolutely. Have we struggled? Absolutely. It's hard. It, you know, being in Striper is probably the toughest job on the planet Earth, musically speaking. And people may sneer at that and say, oh, come on, man. But, you know, the only way I could describe it is come tour with us. Come and, come and ride on our bus for a week. And, I, and I listen, I've, seen, I've seen you guys at 8 a.m. at these sound checks for these festivals. <laughs> and the amount of things that has to be done. And, uh, you know, you guys are flying the same planes. I remember saying, I, what flight are you guys on? I'm going to book one two hours later. That's too early. You know, it's it's not easy. I tell people when your favorite band comes to your town, don't say, oh, I'll see them next time. Go see them because they came a long way to see you. It's so true, man. And that's all the stuff that gets forgotten. And, you know, it, it, we don't expect to be patted on the back and, and you know, uh, praised for it. But it is, it's a tough life. It's not an easy life. And I think a lot of people think that it is a glamorous life, and it's not. Uh, you know, it, it's very tough, but I wouldn't change a thing. I would not change a thing because I look back on the past and I think I see what God's done with and through the band and it's, it blows my mind. I hear stories from people saying I was a drug addict, I was suicidal, and I would have died without Stripe or without your lyric for this song. And I think there it is right there. That makes it all worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen Oz and I've seen you guys make the time for people um, it's more than just a message through music, you know, yep. it's, a, it's a it's a real thing. So I had a question for one of my patrons, Paul Miles, and this is kind of a two part because he wanted to know what was the motivation for Striper reuniting after 15 years. But before you answer that, uh, and I think a lot of people know it, but against the law, I remember I was a kid in high school and against the law came to New York and played the Ritz, which was, was the Studio 54. Imagine Striper playing Studio 54 and uh, Trickster was the opening band. But there were some tough times. And some people love that record. I know it's not your favorite. Um, and it, it, the imaging was the imagery was different, uh, Shining Star video and things. And a lot of this has been talked about. At one point, you left your own band, and there was obligations to play overseas. And your brother and the other two guys went over and played. I, I've, I'm sure it's a sore spot. <laughs> But I, I've always wondered what must it be like when your brother and your band go on and you don't? Well, I mean, the thing is, I did go on. I, I went on and did a solo thing. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's uh, it's one of those situations where I left the band. I mean, I made a choice. I, I, I struggled with that choice for months, uh, a long time, thinking like, OK, I, I need to leave the band because I need to get my priorities in order. Uh, the band does not is not at the top of the list. My family is. My faith in God is, not the band. And the band started to take priority. My marriage was suffering. All of our marriages were suffering. Our uh, our faith was suffering. Our spirituality. We were we were basically not the people we started out being. We walked away from everything. Started pounding alcohol. Uh, which I, everyone knows I like bourbon now. I, I'm not I'm not talking about drinking. I'm just talking about literally pounding it and, and getting hammered, going on stage, telling people about Jesus and going to the bar and getting drunk and, and being walked out of the venue after the show. That's hypocrisy. That's why I don't like that era. That's why I don't like that album. We sold out. We threw everything out the window. And it's, it, you know, I have no good memories of that time what at all. And I, I, I listen to that album and I just think this isn't even the same band. This isn't Striper. That's why I don't like it. Great album, great production, whatever. Some good songs, some of my favorite songs on that album, but we sold out. And 
you know, the band tried to continue on. They went and did a few shows, but then after a, a short amount of time, they realized that it just wasn't the same and they went their separate ways. It didn't work. I think they brought in Dale Thompson of Bride. That didn't work. And then I wound up signing a deal and doing a solo thing uh, and went out and toured as a solo artist for a couple of years and then moved back east. So it was an interesting time, um, but it was certainly the end of Striper for sure, at least for a season. You know, yeah. um, and and then we got back together in in '03, and it, it was all about feeling uh, and, and going with the right moment in time. I didn't want it to be forced. For years, I felt like this is not right. I don't want to do it. And then I I woke up one morning and, and felt like you know what, this is the time to do it. This feels like the time, and that was in '03, and we officially in '04, and then a new record in '05. So there you go, man. Uh, yeah, it was interesting times. And I was the first guy to walk. And because of that, I, a lot of fans were pretty pretty pissed off at me. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you sometimes you had to follow your own heart. I know those guys probably felt like, well, we have these obligations to do these foreign dates. They never did it here in the States. Uh, Oz does a great Michael Sweet impression. I have always told him that. Uh, you got, Your guys' voices work very well together. Yeah. They do work really well together. We have very, when you hear us individually, we have very different voices, different tonality and different delivery. But when we harmonize together, it's, it, you know, we sound like brothers, basically. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's part of that Striper uh, uh, sound. And speaking of that sound, we want to make sure that we let everybody know the final battle. Now, uh, Michael, I feel like you jumped the gun on this title. This is a perfect farewell record, but this isn't farewell, is it? <laughs> Man, I I hope not. I, I, it could be in the sense that we don't know what tomorrow brings. And, it, it, you know, tomorrow is never promised. And I learned that about my eye situation. And you just never know what's going to happen, what's, what you're going to get uh, tomorrow or this week or this month or this year. But that being said, I don't think it's our final album. I think there's more in store. I think God has a plan and uh, there's more to come. I really believe that. But the final battle is representing with the imagery and the title, the Battle of Armageddon, which is in the book of Revelation. And that's what we were trying to portray with the imagery there that you see right there. Yeah, Striper is uh, loaded with powerful imagery, and obviously powerful messages too. I love this. I love the record titles. Each one of them I, I love, uh, and I love that these covers. And uh, you know, you you just you don't uh, you don't fund them in. And also nowadays, making records is a labor of love. No one's getting rich. Uh, a lot of bands would be happy to be a nostalgia act. You you could tour a striper for the rest of your uh, life and just play the hits, and people would be happy. But you for believe sure. in this music and. And thankfully, you make quality music. And I think that's the biggest thing. There's, I, I love the tape of uh, Eddie Trunk and someone calls it and says, what happened to Striper, you know? And, <laughs> and he screams at the guy because there could not be a more active band than Striper. You, you, you are doing it. You're putting out new records. You're making new videos. You're constantly on the road. And so I think uh, uh, it, it's obviously this labor of love and it's what you're calling it. It is for sure. Yeah, that episode of Eddie Trunk is hilarious, man. It, it's so funny. I guess it went viral to some degree. Uh, he went on a bit of a rant in our defense. It was awesome. But uh, regarding, uh, you know, getting rich, making albums. Yeah, no. I mean, we get good budgets comparatively. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends, a lot of these bands get, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40 thousand dollar budgets. If you're really lucky, fifty thousand. I don't know how bands do it for that. I, I have no clue, um, because you literally are probably spending money to make the the album with all the logistics, the cost of airfares and studios and hotels and food and all this stuff, and they put on you the cost of the photo shoot and the artwork and all this. You know, it's just crazy. But Stripe was very blessed that we get pretty good budgets to make these albums frontiers really takes care of us frontiers records serafino he's been a real blessing to us and uh, has helped us to achieve what we need to achieve with every album and again we couldn't do it without them 
So we're very fortunate, and I count my blessings. Whenever I start the end, at the end of the day, I start to complain and think like poor Striper. I think, wait a second here. Uh, uh-uh. uh. We've really we've been blessed, and and people have given us a lot and and so much, and I'm I'm very thankful for that. I talk to bands on here every day. You want to see some poor people? I got. Uh... The Bullet Boys breaking up after one reunion show. Bang Tango breaking up after two reunion shows. And these bands, hey, one guy says, I'm the band. The other guy says, I'm the band. Then this one's suing this one. So uh, it's, it's, uh, you would lose your mind. Dude, it's insane. It, it, I know. I see it. I hear it. I talk to these guys. And it's so dysfunctional. And we are all dysfunctional. We are all, in, 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 in certain ways, to certain degrees, dysfunctional uh but you you have to make it work you know all those things those differences you got to suck it up grow up be an adult stop acting like a child and just say look let's make this work even though we don't see eye to eye let's make it work because we fight straight for fights sure i've heard oh yeah we get into it and usually it's over stupid stuff, like any other band. But we work it out. We a family. Too. You're, you're a family uh, as well. Not just you know, you know, obviously you and Robert, but Oz as well, and everyone involved. You've been doing this a while. I've been doing it a while, and those things are going to happen. And you can either say when it does happen, oh, I'm out of here. I'm done. And that's not why I left back in '92. I left because it was a, a you know. There was a lot that had built up that led to that. And I did, I wanted to save my marriage and my faith. So that's why I left. But I mean, over a simple argument or some, uh, you know, disagreement, it's just silly. And it, it, it blows my mind to see some of these bands and, and read some of this stuff where they just can't work out the differences. And it's so sad because the fans want to want to hear the bands and they want to, they want another album. They want another tour and they, they won't get it because these guys can't work it out. Trust me, I, I'm in rat. I'm up to here in rat drama every day. You know, the, the, a great band that just can't uh, can't work it out, and I'm not sure they ever will. I think it might be the final battle for those guys. But uh, well, you know, I, I hope someday they can work it out. Uh, but you know, it's going to take obviously a lot. It, 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 where it starts is humbling yourself, mm -hmm. putting your pride on the floor. And, and laying it down before God and saying, you know what? I let it go. I give it up. And then once you do that, if you can do that, your heart will open to discussing things with someone you hate. Yeah, I think uh, it takes a big person to get to that, to get to that place. So I, I will say again, uh, go to striper.com because you'll see all the tour dates. Nothing's slowing down. You guys are out there, going to be out there all in the new year. As well, you guys are also all over the, the world, not just playing here in the States. You guys just got back. I think you were just in Mexico, right? We were. We were just in Mexico. We went and did two festivals, one with Kiss uh, in Pantera and, uh, excuse me, Kiss and, um, ah, I don't remember the lineup, uh, Megadeth. Right. Kiss and Megadeth and a bunch of other bands. And then another one with uh, Judas Priest and uh, Behemoth and Merciful Fate and Pantera. And yeah, it, it's, it blows my mind that Stripers ask to do these shows. And see, that's, that's another uh, reason why I'm saying no complaints. I'm thankful. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't know why Stripers seems to be, uh, you know, chosen often and in, 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 in like picked, hand-selected for some of these things. And I'm just saying to myself, why? What do we have that other bands don't? Nothing. Nothing. But it, it really blows my mind that we have these opportunities and it's very humbling. It really is. Yeah. So make sure you come see Striper. They and they can play whether there's power or not. You guys have proven that. <laughs> you, you went to the whiskey a go go, two sold out shows. Your second night, the power goes out right before your set. And uh, whose idea is it to try to play with practice apps, battery powered? Well, Perry was backstage saying we gotta go out and do something. And then there was a uh, there was a, a bouncer pastor who works at the whiskey who kept saying, "Yeah, you guys should go out and do like a, a Q and A." 
And I'm thinking, okay, we got to do something. So I grabbed my little power amp and I just started walking to the stage. I said, I'll be back. And then the, all the other guys were like, where are you going? They followed me. I was just going out to ask the crowd, look, we could do two things. We could either all go home or we could play through these little practice amps. <laughs> and they wound up, we wound up playing through the practice amps. And the batteries in my amp died. It wasn't fully charged. And it was crazy, man. It was such an interesting, special night. Crowd used their cell phones for lights. They sing along. Wow. What, a, what an experience. A historical. Amazing. Yeah. And you guys are already scheduled to come back next year. So for people who... Uh, at the whiskey, you want to see uh, the the electric show? Uh, you'll you'll have that chance. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for spending the time. I know it's the holidays, and uh, you know, and you're moving. A lot of things going on. You're constantly on the road, so I appreciate you taking some time to waste a little time with me here today. And I really look forward to seeing you again and Striper on the road. Of course, my friend, it's been a pleasure. Excellent job. You're a true gentleman, and I appreciate you wanting to even talk to me. Oh, well, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. I, Michael, I think people are intimidated by you. I, I oh. find in my, in my paths, people might be in, intimidated by you. But oh, uh, man, I'm just, I'm a regular dude, man. And I think I say this all the time, but I mean it. If people just came and hung out with me and had a cup of coffee, I think they would leave agreeing with the fact that he's just a regular guy, you know, it is, I, I, I'm I'm nothing special. I'm no one special, and I, I'm just I like to laugh and have fun, and uh, there's no need for any intimidation whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. So now you guys know that when you see them. Uh, again, striper.com. The final battle available now. Thank you guys for watching, and uh, we'll see you again.